Matasa Bhagavata Arahato Samma Sambhutasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hope everybody has had a good week. It's been a traveling time for me. I'm in Poland now, and it's a lot cooler here and um, getting on fairly well with plans for first retreat. And the first retreat we're having here will be um, from the 16th to 26th. These are uh, sort of specialized uh, retreats. I need to get um, something just a second. I need my other eyes, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this um this getting old is interesting. <laughs> I have a collection of glasses now. It's like a new hobby. <laughs> So I hope you're all doing well. Um, so we start with Sekha Sutta. Uh, this one is talking about, uh, you'll notice it's talking about four jhanas, but it's uh, including the four mental jhanas as the subcomponents that are sitting inside of the, uh, the Rupa and Arupa. The Arupa jhanas are sitting inside of the fourth Rupa jhana is what I'm trying to say. And um, this is one that's bringing up um, seven good qualities of the uh, seven good qualities of the meditator that you develop, okay, that tells you how to uh, be sure that you have these work on these qualities of development for purification. So it's called the Sekha Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 53, and it's the disciple in, disciple in higher training. Thus, I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Kapalavatu in Nagrodas Park. Now, on that occasion, a new assembly hall had recently been built for the Sakyans of Kapalavatu, and it had not yet been inhabited by any recluse or a Brahmin or a human being at all. And then the Sakyans of Kapalavatu, they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side, and they said to him, Venerable Sir, a new assembly hall has recently been built here for the Sakins of Kapilavatu. It has not yet been inhabited by any recluse or Brahmin or human being at all. And Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One be the first one to use it. When the Blessed One has used it first, then the Sakins in Kapilavatu will use it afterwards. That will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. The Blessed One consented in silence. And then when they saw that he had consented, they got up from their seats. And after paying homage to him, keeping him on their right, they went to the assembly hall. So to pay respect, we keep the teacher on the right side. They covered it completely with coverings and prepared the seats and they put out a large water jug and hung up an oil lamp. And then they went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, they stood at one side and they said, Venerable Sir, the assembly hall has been covered completely with coverings. Seats have been prepared, the large water jug has been put out, and an oil lamp hung up. Let the Blessed One come at his own convenience. 
and then the Blessed One dressed. And taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to the Sangha of monks to the assembly hall. And when he arrived, he washed his feet and entered the hall and sat down by the central pillar facing the east. And the monks washed their feet and then entered the hall and sat down by the western wall facing the east with the Blessed One before them. So they're sitting behind him and they're facing the, um, the audience of the others listening. And the Sakyans of Kapilavatu, they washed their feet and they entered the hall and sat down by the eastern wall uh, facing the west with the Blessed One before them. And then when the Blessed One had instructed, urged and roused and gladdened the Sakyans of Kapilavatu with talk on the Dhamma for much of the night, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, speak to the Sakyans of Kapilavatu about the disciple in higher training who has entered upon the way. My back is uncomfortable, I will rest it. So we know now that this uh, is a time when the Buddha is older and due to the fact of in another lifetime, he had been a wrestler. We have uh, the stories telling us that he had injured many people's backs and that this is coming back to him as a karmic, a karmic uh, fruit coming back from other times. And so this is a verification, for instance, that an arahat can have uh, something that is a painful feeling coming up and that uh, he needs to rest his body from that physical painful feeling, but it does not disturb his mind. This is what's important to understand. So we don't have the idea that an arahat cannot have a painful feeling, cannot feel anything. That's not the case, okay? So yes, venerable sir, the venerable Ananda replied, and then the blessed one prepared his patchwork cloak and he folded it in four and lay it down on his right side in the lion's pose, put one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware after noting in his mind the time for rising. So we get the picture of the proper position for laying down on your right, you know, with your hand here lying down on the right, and then putting the left foot over the right foot, not the leg, but over the right foot and allowing it to tip down. That's called the lion's pose. So you notice it's interesting because if you find a statue of a Buddha lying down, you need to check and see if it's in the right position. And we used to do that a lot when we were wandering about different Buddhist shops and such. So then the Venerable Ananda, he addressed Mahanama Sakyan, thus Mahanama has a noble disciple. It, here, a noble disciple is possessed of virtue. He guards the doors of his sense faculties, is moderate in eating, devoted to wakefulness. He possesses seven good qualities and he is one who obtains at will without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide pleasant abiding here and now. So this is saying that the monk is practicing determinations to sit for periods of time in the different levels. And how is a noble disciple possessed of virtue? Here, a noble disciple is virtuous, he dwells restrained with the restraint of the Padimokha. He is perfect in conduct and resort, seeing fear in the slightest fault. He trains by undertaking the training precepts. And this is how a noble disciple is possessed of virtue. Then how does a noble disciple guard the doors of his sense faculties? 
Well, on seeing a form with the eye, a noble disciple does not grasp at it, signs and features. And since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, the evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. And he practices the way of its restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. Hmm? So we know what we're practicing. We know how we're doing that with six R's. And on hearing a sound with the ear, he does much the same. On hearing the odor with the nose, he would do much the same. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, he would do much the same. And on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, a noble disciple does not grasp at the signs and features of what has arisen. Because if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief would begin to invade him. And you want it and you can't have it. And then you have grief because you can't get it. That's what that's saying. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. That is how a noble disciple guards the doors of his sense faculties. And how is a noble disciple moderate in eating? Here, reflecting wisely, a noble disciple takes food neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, okay. for uh, ending discomfort or for assisting, uh, the, and insist, just assisting me in the holy life, considering thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and I shall live in comfort. That is how a noble disciple is moderate in eating. And how is the noble disciple devoted to wakefulness? Here, during the day while walking back and forth and sitting, the noble disciple purifies his mind of obstructive states. And in the first watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. In the middle watch of the night, he lies down on the right side when the lines pose with one foot overlapping the other and remains mindful and fully aware. After noting in his mind the time for which he wants to arise and after arising, in the third watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, he purifies his mind of obstructive states. And that is how a noble disciple is devoted to wakefulness. So the three watches of the night, we learn three watches of the night are from seven to 11, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And from 11 to three, hmm, 11 to 3 is the second watch of the night in the morning. And then from 3 to 7, that is the third watch of the night. So you're asleep in that middle one, and you get up for the best time of sitting possible when everybody is asleep, all that consciousness is quiet, and try to sit at that time there's no disturbance and it's very very quiet if you live in a neighborhood everything has just stopped and you sit at that time in this hush time and you have from three until seven in the morning yeah so this is the way they were when they were working hard on their practice they would manage that time frame and how does a noble disciple possess seven good qualities? Here, a noble disciple has faith. He places his faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment thus. 
the blessed one is accomplished, is fully enlightened, is perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, a knower of the worlds, incomparable, leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. So this talking about the nine qualities of the Buddha and going uh, through this, he puts his faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment. That's where faith belongs. When you are practicing meditation and you are just starting, you put your faith in the fact the Buddha found something. You trust that point. So don't go doubt, 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 doubt like that. Just put your faith in it. That's why you've come. That's why you're going to try it. So let's find out what exactly it is and try it in its purest form. And the blessed one is accomplished. He has done it himself, fully enlightened. He has gone through and sort of, uh, we, we've been talking lately about rebooting the mind and coming, uh, going through the, the shutdown and and when it turns on again, what happens is you're rebooting the mind to the default, to pure present time. And you don't have a lot of the past pressing at you or the future pushing at you from the other side, you see? And so this is what's happening. And that this, this person is fully um, enlightened. You know, here we say, uh, let's see, we said true knowledge and conduct. Uh, well, let's see, we have faith. It places his faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment. Blessed one is accomplished. He studied himself, I said, fully enlightened. He's gone through the whole process to the super mundane. And then he is a uh, knower of um, we're perfect in true knowledge and conduct, which the true knowledge is how everything really works. No unessential information pushing, pulling in your mind. Just really seeing clearly how everything really works. And then um, perfect in true knowledge and conduct. And the conduct gets described a little bit more in here. And the sublime is very sublime in his sitting. Very clear, watching, no disturbance, knower of worlds the ability to gee, the ability to visit hell and see who's down there the ability to look in into the pure states and see what's happening he has this ability and the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed we don't need only to reflect on the story of angulimala this is the murderer who comes around and figures out uh, he can stop stop what the Buddha is saying to him, stop it, Angulimala. Angulimala wants to catch him, but doesn't stop. And the Buddha says, I stopped. And he screams at him again, you have to stop. The Buddha says, I have stopped, Angulimala. You need to stop. What does he mean? He means you must stop craving. Stop going after this lustful thing that you're trying to do to kill 1,000 people. You have to stop this now. Stop it completely and let it go. And then what happens is the Buddha is not, he's not able to catch the Buddha because the Buddha just lifts up slightly and just moves ahead of him as he's, as he's running after him. He's this much ahead of him, up off the ground, just floating away. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then the Buddha says, follow me. And he follows him. He catches this idea, maybe there's a way to let go of all this. And then he follows the Buddha. The Buddha teaches him. He becomes a monk. And he changed completely, absolutely completely. And then the last one is teacher of gods and humans. We hear the Buddha teaches the Saka, king of the devas, and he goes to teach the other, on the other levels of existence. These are other dimensions. It's not so far off from uh, talking about um, 
physics and the new physics of the different multiple dimensions and everything. We're not far away from this. This is what he's talking about. He's enlightened, fully enlightened, and able to hold his enlightenment, sees it clearly, doesn't mess it up, and is living present time, present time, present time, even to present moment. And he is totally blessed in this situation. These are the nine qualities. Someday we should do the class on it. There's a couple of really good uh, uh, articles on the nine qualities. The Buddha from some um, Thai monks that wrote it. And it's really, really well written. So anyway, here we go. He has shame. You have shame. This is Hiri. We're talking Hiri and Otapa here. He, you have shame of misconduct of body or misconduct of speech or misconduct of thoughts, ashamed of outraging in evil, unwholesome deeds. You have shame. And Otapa is to have fear of wrongdoing, to be wary of falling towards the, the, the feeling of going forth with an intention to do wrong doing you feel this awareness not to do that he is afraid of misconduct in body speech and mind afraid of engaging in evil and wholesome deeds why yeah because he knows that the the uh, paired piece of that if he breaks a precept and goes in the direction of wrongdoing what will happen then for him is the hindrances will come lots of them to bother him so these hindrances and precepts are interrelated with each other. Next one is, the fourth one is that he has learned much, remembers much what he has learned and consolidates what he has learned. Such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing. And he affirms a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these, he has learned much of them, remembered them, recited verbally, investigated with the mind to see for himself and penetrated them well with view, by his view uh, as he's watching. And when it says, when it says penetrated by view, it means seen it completely impersonally with an impersonal view, not taking any of it personally, just watching things as they are actually happening. This is the progressional uh, effort of mankind. Let us see in the next couple hundred years if this can change mankind and lean more in that direction where sensible solutions can come into being uh, by reasoned, uh, reasoned uh, thinking and examining, mm -hmm. and impersonally looking at present time situations without trying to loop around and use the past reactions of similar things again and again and again. That's what you want to do. Let's hope so. This fifth one is that he is energetic in abandoning unwholesome states and in undertaking wholesome states. And this is what you are doing as you do the six R cycle. Every time you are fulfilling this, you're practicing right effort by seeing an unwholesome state abandoning it, releasing it, and, and undertaking a wholesome state by smiling, okay, and letting things go impersonally and coming back. He is steadfast, firm in this striving, not remiss in developing wholesome states. So when we go to look at the definition for the right effort, when we listen to that, if I flip over to 77 for a minute, if you go over to 77, if you're with me in the books, and you can go to where it is section seven of that sutta, um, the Maha Sakaladaya Sutta, on 638, you, you will see, um, you will see that 
uh, there's a description there for, oops, that's not the right one. I'm sorry, I missed that. It would be section two, it's on 636. I pushed you in the wrong direction. The four right kinds of striving. Uh, striving and right effort basically are the same thing. Using the same precise paragraph when we look it up to find a description of it. And let's look closely to this four, four steps of right effort or the four steps of right striving. And when you say striving, you think, well, I'm doing that all the time. I'm doing that. Does it mean work real hard or does it mean work real smart? It means work smart, not hard. And so here we go. The, the monk awakens and I take the word zeal to mean enthusiasm by definition in many of the sources. So I say, uh, the monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. That's the first step is like you're recognizing that there's an unwholesome state. And then he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives, strives to follow the instructions precisely is what this really means. Doesn't mean work, work, work hard. Doesn't mean get exhausted. It means strive to do it correctly and the same way each time so that your brain learns this new behavioral pattern of recognizing the unwholesome mind state. Then he awakens enthusiasm in the second step for abandoning of any arisen evil unwholesome states. And again, it says the phrase he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. Strives to do what? Strives to abandon them. Just let them go. Abandoning is not hard. Throw a ball up, catch it. Now abandon it. Open your hand and let it drop to the floor. That's it. Just abandon it. Okay. And then the third part is he awakens enthusiasm for arising of the unarisen, a wholesome states. Okay. So now we're using the same, uh, same statement again, and he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And how can he do that the fastest way? What do we know? He smiles. And when he smiles, his mind is light and it feels open and alert and sharp with its awareness. So he just smiles. And when he smiles as he comes back, he's not taking anything personally. He's just watching. He's witnessing. And the next one says he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment of the development of arisen wholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. Now, in this last one, he has enthusiasm for the continuance. In other places, it indicates of like types of wholesomeness coming up. So when the wholesome state, the smiling comes up, that's telling you that's how this should feel. Feel lighter, open, not tight and concentrating and pushing anything. No instructions there, folks, to do that, to push, to make something personally, make something happen. It's just not in there. You have to be careful and, and not fall into that trap. Okay, continuance, non-disappearance means to continue that state till it fades away and other states, any other states that are wholesome to support them until they fade away. Strengthening, increase, and fulfillment of the development of aris any arisen wholesome states. There you are. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. And thereby many disciples of mine abide, having reached uh, the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge, having that work all the way to carry you to the level where you can fall into cessation and then come out and open up. Now, uh, he's energetic, and that's number five. And then we say he has mindfulness. He possesses the highest mindfulness and skill. This is, he has correct observation practice. 
he possesses the highest mindfulness skill. Mindfulness is the in the in the way that we're teaching the mindfulness is the observation skill. We have meditation, okay, meditation here, and you're meditating for the purpose of seeing how everything actually works, understanding the four noble truths, dependent origination, three characteristics completely and deeply and clearly. It all, it's all hooked together, right? It is, okay. And then what happens after that is mindfulness. Uh, that is the meditation, why you're doing it, to see how everything actually works, the true nature of everything and the truly impersonal nature of everything. And then you're looking at mindfulness. And when you say mindfulness, what is that? It is the actual observation skill. And it has a talent. This, this has a talent for remembering, recollecting, reminding us of something, recalling something again and again and again in the practice process of right effort. And this mindfulness is reminding us that it's, it's time to do the six R's if we feel any change in tension, change in tightness in our mind or in our body then that signals to us it's time to let go, relax, smile, come back, see? And then uh, when you look at it more closely, you say, well, that's what I, it reminds me of. And then when you start doing those steps, it recalls it's a good idea for you to do all six steps, all six of those steps, not, not just a couple of them, but all six of them the same way every time. And it remembers what will happen if you keep doing that. You will stay clear and your uh, natural uh, mechanism of observation will be very clear and astute so that you can see clearly the true nature of how everything works. So that's your mindfulness. And he recollects what was done a long, long ago before in the process of the instructions and it was spoken long ago, how to do this. He's referring, that's referring to the instructions that have been preserved is what he's doing. It's not, it's not meaning you remember something that happened five years ago. It's not about that. Okay, it's remember, referring to remembering how uh, all of this actually operates and not forgetting the precise way that it works the best way. That's what we're looking at here, okay. Okay, um, then the next part mm -hmm. Okay. The seventh part is he is wise. Now, remember, in our practice, the way we're teaching you with to him, we figured out that universally, when you look at the word wisdom, or he is wise, or he saw with wisdom, or he was wise when he was watching, it has to do, it signals something. So what does that wise, what is a code word wise or wisdom or seeing wisely and that sort of thing? If you say it and think about dependent origination, you get a much deeper meaning, much, much deeper meaning, okay. So he is wise, he possesses wisdom regarding the rise and the disappearance that is noble and penetrative, which leads to the complete destruction of suffering. And that is what the dependent origination line actually does. If you are examining it in terms of um, one event occurring at a time in your life. Now, you know, there are many things in life, for instance, we could look at figure skating, you know, figure skating is a good example. If we were to learn figures and figure skating, we would learn them on a broad base in large parts. First, we would not attempt to do them small. Then we would take a patch of ice with our skates and we would start doing the very small ones very precisely. So you could examine how accurately we could do that with the blade of a skate, an ice skate. 
So we don't begin by learning uh, the curve to this way, the curve to that way, the eight, you know, like that and moving away or the three that goes like this and then goes like that, moves away, goes like this, it goes, let me see if I can do it. It goes like, um, like this and like that and whoops, like that in a way, that's a three upside down. It's a, I'm sort of reversed here. It's kind of confusing me. <laughs> but when you do those little figures and everything in skating, when you're dancing uh, in skating, uh, you are judged with the class on your figures and then on your scores for your dancing and the accuracy. And sometimes the judges will go right out there on the ice and they'll measure against one person or another person. What is the accuracy of how precise they can do that? But they didn't learn to do those things jumping accurately, spinning accurately, uh, doing the different figures within the maneuvers when they're skating. They just learn to do that small first. They learned to do it larger first and then more and more and more and more accurately to the very precise parts that you can mark on the ice. And this is kind of how we learn this stuff. You know, we learn it from a larger scale first and uh, not seeing things so clearly and precisely, and it gets sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper until it's just that sharp, just that sharp. And then we can see the smaller, deeper parts with smaller parts more completely. So it's interesting that that's how this is working when you question students uh, over a long period of time, you see they're all talking about it the same way. So here it's saying he is wise, he possesses wisdom regarding the rise and disappearance that is noble and penetrative and that and leads to the complete destruction of suffering and independent origination. What's he talking about? Basically here, that person first learns and then learns to watch the arising of a phenomenon. And then it is usually mind, a mind object, and mind consciousness coming together and forming contact. And with contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, then craving arises. And the craving is the I don't, I don't like it mind or the I like it mind that jumps in. And then with craving as condition, Clinging arises, and the clinging is the story that runs through your mind, like very prolifically through your mind, of actually why you like or dislike something, and as a tendency to uh, get attached to it, and lots of things and thoughts about holding on to it, or not get attached to it, and uh, just try to, uh, you don't like it and you, um, you don't want it there. So all of a sudden you flip into another form of attachment, trying to make it stop, make it change, you see? So it's pulling and pushing you, pulling and pushing you with an equal kind of force around liking, wanting an attachment or not liking, not wanting, and then getting attached to the idea that you want can make it stop and do that rather than let it go. So it's trap pulling you into thinking, I can make all of this work. You can't. The person who succeeds in the progress easily and reaches the level where they can just stop and then come back and start again is the person who just watches and witnesses. That's what happens. And how is a noble disciple one who obtains at will without trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now? Well, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a noble disciple or a practitioner enters upon and abides in the first level of cessation or first jhana. With the stilling of the applied and sustained thought. Now that means thinking or examining thought. So thinking thought is here's a thought and it happens, but you don't expand it. Uh, and thinking and, uh, you know, 
uh, examining thought flows into other little circles going like this, really spinning really fast with more and more circles. And that is mental proliferation, where it just keeps rolling on and on about why, uh, what happens next, okay. Now with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, he enters and abides in the second jhana. And then with the fading away as well of joy, he enters upon and abides in the third. And we've been through these a lot lately talking about them and with the abandoning of pleasure and pain. That's abandoning concern for pleasure or concern for pain, just letting it arise, be there, fall away, not getting involved or expanding it at all. Um, mm -hmm. He enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and a purity of mindfulness, a pure form of observation due to equanimity, an observation that cannot be disturbed. It stops being disturbed. That is how a noble disciple is one who obtains at will, without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas and that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now. Now, there's some traditions will say that the fourth jhana is where the equanimity happens all at once, and it's just there perfectly, solidly, and cannot be disturbed at all. But what we find in observing people over the past 20 years in different retreats is that the degree of equanimity is growing from the time you first start and it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and locked in in the fourth jhana is where it's just very stable. And then you can reach from there going into more easily to experience infinite space and infinite consciousness and nothingness, okay? Now, when a noble disciple has thus become one who is possessed of virtue and guarding the doors of his sense faculties, and he is moderate in eating, and he's devoted to wakefulness, paying attention to observing as much as possible in life, this really means who possesses the seven qualities that are stated here, who obtains at will without any trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind. They provide a pleasant abiding here and now. And if you will rest in them and not jump around thinking, dissecting, it's very hard in your examination. It's not supposed to be doing that. You're just supposed to be witnessing, just watching. You will go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, longer and longer and longer. He is called one in higher training who has entered upon the way and his eggs are unspoiled. He is capable of breaking out capable of in full enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. Now suppose there were a hen with eight or 10 or 12 eggs, which she had covered carefully and incubated and nurtured them properly. And even though she did not wish, oh, that my chicks might pierce their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatch out safely. Yet still the chicks are capable of piercing their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatching out safely. And so too, when a noble disciple has thus become one who is possessed of virtue, he is called one of the higher training who has entered upon the way. His eggs are unspoiled. He is capable of breaking out capable of enlightenment, and he is capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. Based upon the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity, this noble disciple recollects his manifold past lives. And thus with the aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives as deeply as he wishes. If you're 
doing this for different reasons i'll explain in a minute this is his first breaking out like that of the hens chicks from their shells you know looking and recollecting past lives is not impossible and if you work with this many people many teachers don't want to get involved in in teaching it but you know it's not it's not a bad thing but what's tough about it is if you do this and you do it well in detailed ways, you need to keep it a private thing, you know, to have people rushing to you to find out what this is and what happened and everything. Well, that's not what it's for. And that's why a lot of teachers don't want to teach it. But if there is a phobia for someone who needs help to get over a phobia, can we use this for a tool? to get over fear of heights, to get over any sort of phobia that exists at all. Um, can we use this to help us do that? And yes, you can. Because if you do work with this with a teacher, you should work with a teacher the first times you're working with this is important. So you understand until you understand one thing. This is absolutely not real, <laughs> meaning that it's not happening for real here or any danger to you when you're practicing this way. But when you learn to move back to take a look at something um, to find out why you're afraid of water or why are you afraid of heights or different things like that, you just simply allow yourself to see what happened before in what comes up and watch. And what the effect of it is, you have the feeling there was something to do with these other people. But they're not you. And you kind of know they're not you. Obviously, you're here now. So you're not you. But the question is, um, the consequence of working that way is you come away thinking, well, you know, they don't have anything to do with this timeline with me here. And then you're not afraid anymore. You've identified that the fear comes up from a recollection you can't really explain of an earlier consciousness in some, some other uh, time. And when you uncover it, in, and you don't have to get really detailed, what was my name, where did I live, what was the village, all this stuff, that's not what this is about. This is about relieving yourself that this pressure of something that just changed in your life suddenly, where you're all of a sudden afraid of heights, but you weren't afraid of heights for 50 years. How do you explain that? And then when it's cleared away, how do you explain that? Because you your mind, your brain connected. It wasn't something to do with anything in this life. It was just some memory floating in a consciousness from an energy of consciousness that was moving along from karmic action from somewhere else, the energy, see? You let go and now you know you're safe in this world. That's the effect this has. These aspects in particular is that you recollect in your manifold past lives. Um, this is the first uh, breaking out like that of a hen's chicks from their shells is when you realize you can do that. Okay, great. Now, based upon the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human the noble disciple sees beings passing away and reappearing. And you can have that experience if you simply um, ask the brain and, and you, you sit there and allow this to process through. Sometimes it will take hold and you'll roll back and you'll see beings uh, are passing away according to their actions and they might be sitting in hell. And you might go into a sitting and then be sitting next to somebody and you're wondering where'd that come from and if communicating almost telepathically with this person to find out why are you here what happened and having them inform you it's kind of um, spooky to find out that's why they're in hell but it verifies for you what does it do it supports the idea of karmic karma and actions and the energy that passes, that's what's going on. So this is all, of course, hypothetical, but 
when you have a few experiences with this, it's less hypothetical. But um, you know, I'm I'm telling you that these things are real, but I don't expect you to believe me unless you experience them. To be quite honest, um, and so this is his second breaking out like that of a hen's chicks. Is learning to do the exercise where you can sit next to somebody and actually communicate. The thing about this is it can be very disturbing for people if you're not with a teacher and you can't go inside and say, okay, what was that? What just happened? And the teacher assure you, this is not real. You're in this time frame. That's from that time frame. And it's a floating energy. There's no way, other way to talk about it in another dimension from another period. But it helps you because you realize that some of the things you're concerned about that you weren't concerned about before in your life ever, and they came up, you can let them go. They're not having anything to do with this life. And that's how the release takes place. Based upon the same supreme mindfulness, whose purity is due to equanimity by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, and this noble disciple here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind, and deliverance by wisdom. And deliverance by wisdom is understanding. Uh, that's the whole framework of dependent origination and deliverance of mind is getting clear with the time frames and being more assured you're living in this time frame and there are other time frames that exist also. And the deliverance by wisdom uh, that are taintless and the destruction of the taints are happening gradually as you're getting involved in this. They're gradually falling away, falling away, melting away, melting away. And then as you realize that, you have to support them. You have to keep that going. You have to not break that chain of development. And so this is the third breaking out, like that of the hen's chicks from their shells. Okay. And when the noble disciple is possessed of virtue that pertains to his conduct, when he guards the doors of his sense faculties that pertains to his conduct, when he is moderate in eating, that pertains to his conduct as well. And when he is devoted to wakefulness, that pertains to his conduct. All of these things are pertaining to your conduct and how you are living in this life, and they get to be very useful. And when he possesses seven good qualities and, and that, that pertains to his conduct also. And when he is one who obtains at will without trouble and difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding here and now that pertains to his conduct as well and it affects him in his conduct and you know it's fun for you to go through and take a look at some of the notes that go with this one um and there are some good there are some good things that you can reflect on um there's a further list for instance of the 15 factors making up conduct it's called the karana uh, which are often conjoined with the three types of knowledge in the complete course of the whole training. What's interesting, the more that you get into this and the longer that you are working with it, you, you come to see there is a very vast uh, uh, connection that is a, uh, a vast connection that runs through the material that is very often causally related. Even if you're practicing just the Brahma Viharas, when we are showing you how to practice the way we're teaching, okay, you find out metta, practice correctly, observed correctly, not pushed or pulled or bossed around, but allowed to develop freely will become the causal relationship with karuna arising. And karuna will lead to mudita. And the mudita will lead to the upeka. So there seems to be a causal relationship. And if you want to play with that idea, you go on over and make yourself a list of the 37 requisites of enlightenment on a piece of paper. And you know the, the pieces in that. And, and then when you look at that, you try to see if in the sets of four pieces, five pieces, seven pieces, or eight, piece, eight parts of the Eightfold Path, any of the fours or fives or seven or eight pieces are they causally related? 
and test it out for yourself. The Buddha was asking you to get involved in testing everything and not just to believing it because it's on a page and you read it and think you understand it, but so you can actually practice it and test it and see if it's actually real and working. Good. So now when the noble disciple is possessed of virtue, pertains to his conduct, he guards the doors of the sense faculties. We just went through that whole one. Everything's pertaining to his conduct. And he recollects about the past lives and their aspects. With the divine eye, he sees beings passing away and reappearing and understands how these beings pass on according to their actions that pertains to his true knowledge. And when by uh, realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of uh, mind and deliverance by wisdom, the, the two pieces working together, okay? And that are taintless with the destruction of the taints pertaining to his true knowledge. So this noble disciple is thus said to be perfect in true knowledge perfect in conduct, perfect in true knowledge and conduct. And this stanza was uttered by the Brahma, Sanan Kumara. He said this, the noble clan is held to be the best of people as to lineage, but best of gods and humans is one, perfect, perfect in true knowledge, and in conduct combined. Now that stanza was well sung by the Brahma, Sanankumara, not ill sung, and it was well spoken, not ill spoken, and it has a meaning and is not meaningless. It is, it was approved by the Blessed One himself. Then the Blessed One rose and addressed the venerable Ananda thus. Good, good, Ananda, he said. It is good that you have spoken to the Sakyans of Kapilavatu about the disciple in higher training who has entered upon this way. And that is what the venerable Ananda said, and the teacher approved. The Sakyans of Kapilavatu, they were satisfied and delighted with the venerable Ananda's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So these are things that, you know, you see how even in a small subject like this, it's not really a big, vast, wide one. The very specific way he's teaching and the points he's giving, and he's asking you to challenge these, he's asking you to test these for yourself, not saying, this is it, and don't question me. I'm not like that at all. No pressure in this training. I was listening to somebody say there was pressure, and I was wondering, where's the teacher that's giving pressure? It's not one of our teachers that's been approved. We don't know where it came from. <laughs> so really, this, is, this might happen in any place with anything that someone's teaching. But... Um, we need to be careful because from the base of Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, if you knew Bhante Vimala Ramsey from the beginning, you would know why he worked so hard to find this practice, why he worked for so many years to be gentle with it and to help people take it and not push and not try too hard. And you're not, you're not told you have to do anything. At one point, I remember we were actually telling people, you know, you come to investigate TWIM and at a retreat, and if you don't like it afterwards and you want to just take the whole package we gave you and drop it in the trash can on the way out, it's okay. You don't want to do it, that's fine. But uh, most of the time, if we ever have ever spoken to anybody about the practice, we find out why and what happened to that person in the training that they might be a little frustrated with it, but frustration is not the norm here. People are changing their lives and they're very happy with the changes they're seeing and able to keep the practice going in life. So that's what I'm hoping that you will, you will do with testing things. So how do you feel about this little sutta? Hmm? You can, anybody have any questions? Yeah.
Hey, you. How you doing? Oh, good, good. Um, I I really like the uh, um, metaphor of the of the egg and the chicks, and I wanted to ask you a question. Does uh, does this mean that by simply adopting adopting the qualities that were described in the sutta here, progress towards uh, nibbana is inevitable? rather than I would, uh, something yeah, I would that you have to make a conscious leaning of the mind towards. Well, there's all variations in somebody saying leaning towards something, you know, um, intentions have different variations of form and different variations of pressure and all that in people, you know, hard to say, but but the thing I would say, yeah, if you left it alone and you were only, this is the big one today, can any of you actually sit there in meditation and just watch and be a witness? You need to look up what a watcher is or a witness and really investigate those words. You're not doing anything. You are, you're essentially to, to reach a level where you can fall into cessation and basically turn off and turn back on. One has to not be there anymore. That's a prerequisite for it. So it means I'm not trying it. There's even, you know, even if we go into 128, when we say you, you're not trying to make anything happen, you are strictly allowing stuff to happen. That goes along with watching and witnessing. It'd be fun to investigate that word and play with it a little bit. Like if you take witness and just to witness and to just watch and you look up the verbal history on those two words, then, then what goes with that? You just watch, you don't do anything. There's no doing. And that's, you know, there's no pushing, there's no demanding, certainly. And there's no, uh, and then when you say the word intention, intention, like, look at that. How strong is the intention? We see that phrase sometimes. How strong was the person's intention when you're writing about a uh, practice? But if you have a strong, strong intention, you could run into in 178 having a, a, a def definite uh, hindrance that's called longing in section 24 of 128. So now longing is because you are longing because of the longing you have, the concentration breaks down. And when my concentration breaks down or the collectedness strike breaks down, the light and the vision of forms disappears and you, you can't just watch anything going on anymore everything blurs and falls away there's nothing nothing goes prog progress stops because you're you're longing so the question is what are the words what are the verbs that are involved with witnessing and watching are there verbs other should other verbs be okay to put in there other action words about those that idea to witness something or to watch it and the other thing is you're just allowing something to happen that's why many years ago i came and i said i think i can say what you are trying to teach us i was talking to bunty uh, what you are trying to teach us is how to experience an experience of no experience, <laughs> where you're just simply witnessing. And that's when he said, yep, that's right. <laughs> but, but telling people today who think they have to be in charge and all these magazines that say you've got to get a hold of yourself and control your life. And there's all this push, 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 push for all the parts of our life to get what we want and have what we want to succeed the way we want to succeed and a B plus is not good enough. No, you have to have an A plus. You got to, you know, it's, it's so push, 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 push that we've moved far away from the uh, traditional levels of spirituality and discovery of um, transcendence, transformation and everything. It's been shut down because we have to fall in line. And next year, if the advertisers change the marketing, we have to fall in line again. Look at that. I can't wear a short skirt. I have to wear a long skirt next year. I, I'm, I'm in Poland right now. I just went to a mall. I was going to a doctor and I went into a mall afterwards. And um, when I went in this mall, I was looking at women's clothes here. And I have to tell you, I wish, you know, if I was not a nun, I would want to live in Poland to wear clothes. 
This is true. It's all so laid back and not tight and not formed. And if you were somebody who gained weight in your arms or gained weight in your thighs, nobody would care with the clothes. There, uh, it, whether it's a big overly sized uh, sweatshirt or a beautiful gown in a private dressing uh, dress designer shop, those gowns are also looking this way, you know. And I suppose only that person who is a size two, <laughs> you know, or size six, who has this perfect little figure and is just always going to be that way because that girl, she has the highest metabolism in the world. She can eat anything she wants and nothing will ever change. Maybe they want to go and they get fitted tight, but the majority of women in the world, I'm going to tell you, they're not like that. And they're very lovely. And you have a plain dress that's just really just draped material it seems seems to be a lot of material right now <laughs> that's what i thought about when i saw these things and then i thought no 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 it's a it's a whole sense of relaxation this men's clothes too men's suits and jackets and styles of stuff everything is not tight you see and uh i'm interested in that as social cycle social psychology socially and psychologically I'm thinking social psychology here. You're looking at the vastness of people saying, we've had enough. Just relax, you see? And everybody steps back and there's no tightness and it's all beautiful. If you want to put a necklace on and dress this gorgeous dress that was made, but the sleeves uh, are not tight here at all. They're only tight here from here to here. So who knows if you have a big arm, a small arm or no arm, who knows? <laughs> and I was just getting a kick out of walking from store to store in uh, this beautiful place and looking at what designers decided to do over here. It's time for everybody just to <sighs> take a breath, see? So when you look at it in tension, what do you mean? And what you mean and I mean, okay, what does somebody else mean by intention? You see? And how much effort is in their definition and how much effort is in ours? So this is the problem for Buddhism, trying to teach Buddhism. When we get up and we speak to more than, well, maybe 20 people or 50 people, I can't tell. I know what I want to say, and I try to say it and know what I mean. And you listen and you hear something, but you, I have to trust that you heard what I meant and understand what I said. That's conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you. And yeah. Huh? Um, and. Uh, um, and I think it's it's very very helpful um, to see this this process of going from what you described as the big to the small. In, in yep. The analogy with the with the, the figure skating, um, with a gradually increasing cessation or process of cessation. Uh, and that and that slowly rising equanimity, because the equanimity itself also implies this um, lack lack of push. Mm -hmm. um, and going from the big to the small, you can't push with very small things. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and, and so I think that's quite a quite a, a nice imagery there that uh, it, it's very helpful, I think. Um, that's good. That's good. Yeah, even you, know, you. you think back in elementary school, even if you were learning to put to throw a ball into a basketball net, when you were in first grade, second grade, you were standing in a circle where the lines were outside, throwing it back and forth to each other first, weren't you? And, uh, you know, then you might get in a game of dribbling, pushing it back and forth between each other, maybe. But then finally, you're going to try to you're going to have to stand in front of that net and you're going to play pig or play horse. You know, we have these little games where you who who gets um, when you make a basket or something, you get a, a letter and whoever gets the word 
wins the game. And um, you start to play that and start to do this. And then later on, you move around with, with active movement and try to get it into there. So there's an example of gradually doing it from a wider base to a smaller base to a smaller base. So we, we have lots of things in life uh, where we learn things that way. And it seems to me, from what I've observed in 21 years here, that <laughs> that, that seems to be how people pick it up. They see it wide first, and then it gets a little smaller, smaller, and, and it gets more precise, but not with any pressure, not with any pressure at all. No, you can't. If you push, it's going to take you longer to be able to do it, much the, longer. The, the, the trick is to perhaps to recognize that small doesn't mean focused, doesn't mean contained. Yeah. Um, and, and it's it's how do you remain wide while small? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So when you come into Poland, <laughs> ah well, uh, I don't think I'm going to make the start of the the first uh, retreat because I've still got the first uh, one yet. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've got to go back again on next Monday. Um, yeah. And but. Um, Is it it seems to be a rush about health issues all over the place <laughs> happening all at once, you know, uh, with many of us. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But anyway, um, uh, but I me, hope you can me... do it while I'm over here. Yeah. I hope you can do it once. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'd certainly like to. So if you can give me uh, your dates and because uh, I don't want to I don't want to come in sort of. Uh, mid retreat because that, that's a bit too I'm, disruptive. Okay, um, I I still am working on gathering information together on what's going on for me. So I have okay. another doctor's appointment on the thirteenth, and then I might know a little more the sixteenth to the twenty sixth. That'll be the first um, the first retreat, and that'll be for twelve to fourteen people only. That's a closed one. Okay, but then in July we're not sure what will happen if there's if there's some kind of if there's a surgery or anything that happens, the idea here from everybody is just keep writing and we'll take care of you through July. That Use July for that month. That was one idea. And um, I don't know if I'll have to move. It's very tricky here. <laughs> you know, this is not an easy place because English is not uh, prevalent in the places you really want it to be prevalent. In India, we was always enough English floating around in hospitals or doctors or laboratories. And over here, it's a bit, it's a bit trickier. So, you know, we'll see what happens with it. Better okay. after the 13th, I'll know something. Yeah, and then after that, um, we'll decide what's going to happen by what happens out of that meeting. And I, I'm hoping to be able to do online retreat in, in July at some point. Even if there is something that is surgical that happens, it'll keep my mind off it. <laughs> so what I thought about, so I can do that. Okay. So, so I don't know, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Okay, so you, you, we, you've got one retreat from 16th to the 26th, and then are you hoping for uh, other face-to-face -face retreats? The, the original idea was to do one uh, in June and get this one done, and then uh, work through some books and writing and some thing, things in the development of the plans and everything. And then July, uh, take care of anything that has to be taken care of. Uh, if there might be a retreat in July, but we don't see it right now. But okay. we see people wanting an August retreat at the retreat okay. center. We're using a nice retreat center for uh, the one that is happening in June. And so if we can go back in, in August to do that before I go back to India, uh, okay, we'll see. But like I said, we don't, we don't really have like enough precise news about what's going on uh with me until we get through this meeting on the 13th yeah okay. then okay. i can i'll know a little bit more <laughs> okay okay yeah. well certainly uh, good luck with that and uh, yeah. yeah i'm crossing my fingers and my toes and my yes. head and everything <laughs> I'm not hung up about it it's very funny i keep saying well, i should be more upset about this but i'm actually not i just you know, this is it. This is what's happening. And so I've, I've 
looked at that and taught people about it for years. So I must have gotten it in here somehow. <laughs> it's like one of the Kramer things I talk about, a Kramer adventure in mm-hmm. Jerry Seinfeld. You know, I know this stuff, you know, uh, so it hasn't, it, I'm not sure what it is yet. So how can I get upset about it? Uh, how many times have I told you that about worrying about the future, you see? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to put out a lot of uh, stuff about this and your energy and everything unless you know more about what's really happening. So they're closer. We certainly have had enough tests, that's for sure. (laughs) You know, so yeah, it's interesting. When I was little, I didn't even want to see that woman at the hospital who was going to prick my finger. And now, here you go. Here's your arm. <laughs> you know, I said, I'm all organized now. You stab me here, stab me there, stab me where you want me to stab. It's all right. It's just, it's a Nietzsche, right? It arises and it passes away. This is the kind of stuff that goes through my head through this whole adventure of anything physical going on. You just start applying everything you know and look at what's going on. Why should we just have it going on in this Zoom or when you're sitting in meditation or in a retreat? No, 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 no. I mean, start looking around and having, wow, this is true when I'm driving and true when I'm working and true when this person is standing here yelling at me because I didn't pay the bill on time. It's all there. It's all it's all usable, what we're showing you. So grab a hold of it and start using it and start smiling because, you know, I'm not saying you have to smile all the time, but I will tell you something. It's a lot more fun. (laughs) You know, everybody's trying to, people are all upset and you're standing there. "Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. This is what's happening. Now let's decide what are we going to do? And they're all there like thinking, why is she smiling? (laughs) Because why not? (laughs) You know, one time when I was little, it rained really hard and there was a serious flood in the neighborhood where I lived and my dad's, um, the we had like a, it wasn't a recreation room, but it wasn't really finished that much, but he had a little bar down there from World War II where his friends used to come and have a beer and talk to each other and stuff like that, you know, and there was a boat, there was a boat down there hanging on the wall, a rowboat. And so when the water was about two feet deep, um, my mother was really, really, really upset. And my father just said, you know, why don't you come downstairs with me and sit in the boat? (laughs) He took the boat off the wall and it was floating. He knew that the whole downstairs would have to be emptied and pumped out. And here is this man sitting in a tiny rowboat in the middle of a room that's like almost two feet of water and she was <laughs> she finally gave in she started laughing and she went downstairs somewhere there is in existence some somewhere a picture of the two of them sitting in the boat but I don't know where it is now <laughs> this is funny but I think from seeing that happen with them and a few other adventures along the way with snow and ice and rain and stuff in Pennsylvania Uh, When I was growing up, there was a lot of snow and there were a lot of problems and the storms were different. Things have changed. Uh, But when you go through some things like that, then remember that. Have fun. You know, after all, it's what's arising is going to pass away. Right. (laughs) So our thing is to, you know, Shakespeare was to be or not to be, that is the question. Ours is to crave and cling or not to crave and cling. That is the Buddhist question. And if you don't crave and cling, well, then you may as well smile. Yeah, try it. You know, you'll begin to see what I mean. And it sounds goofy, but just try it. (laughs) You can always blame me, okay? So um, we should say a prayer. Does anybody else have any questions? We'll open it a little bit here. Anybody else have a question? Yeah? No questions. Okay. (laughs) Okay, we must, I hope we're getting this through. Okay, okay. Uh, So let's, let's give a prosing prayer, everybody. Okay. Okay. 
May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, the devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit with me. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you, sister. See you later. I'll keep you posted on things. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.